right, so as you all already know, we have Richard Todd with us today. Uh, we're going to spend some time just talking to him a little bit about his career. Uh, so Rick, if you don't mind, why don't you just get us started? Tell us um, how you started playing the horn. Well, uh, I my first instrument was piano. And I started playing uh, piano when I was four. And um, I kept that going until I was about eight or so. And when I was eight, I w started, as most young boys would do, started getting a little antsy and a little bored with playing the piano. It's like, you know, I want to want to play something else. And so I was given, uh, my, my mother being a pianist and my stepfather being a music educator, they kind of realized that, uh, well, let's give him something that, first of all, will keep his interest for a while, and, and second of all, uh, th that uh, will actually give him an opportunity to maybe have a career in. There are, because they, they realized, you know, there were so many trumpet players and clarinet players and flute players and drummers and all that kind of stuff. Um, so they said, here's your choices. You can play double reeds, string instruments, or the French horn. And as a short, fat, eight-year-old kid with glasses, the, the thought of carrying a violin case to school was a little on the frightening side. So I literally picked the French horn because it seemed to be the most macho of all of the instrument choices. So that really was why I started playing the French horn. There's no other reason that I can remember other than that. Thank you. Um, so when did you begin studying with uh, a private teacher? And, and who were your first teachers? Well, my first horn teacher was actually a music educator whose primary instrument was clarinet. Um, his, uh, his name was Anthony Desiderio, and this was all in Southern California, which is where I grew up. And his children used to take piano lessons from my mother. So you can kind of see where this is going, you know, the, the trade stuff. And, and, and he got me going for a couple years, which was just fine because first of all, you know, I was too small to actually hold the instrument properly and I didn't know any fingerings and any scales and pretty much any music educator can help you with things like that. And he was great. And um, he, was also the, um, he was also the band director at the local uh, community college. And when I was 12 years old, he let me play um, a band version of the second movement of Mozart's third horn concerto with his community college band. And so uh, my mother actually found the photograph of that. It was in a newspaper and everything. And, and there is this little photo that, that I finally got about a, a year or so ago of, of Dr. Desiderio shaking my hand after my concert. And I'm wearing a little white coat and a bow tie. And, um, I looked about as nerdy as you could possibly look. And, um, and so I, I studied with him for a few years, and then I actually went to a, um, a real horn player for a teacher after that. Um, through uh, the University of Southern California, they used to have this, uh, this, this program called the prep department, which was basically you know an extension, high school, junior high, and so on. And, and you could take private lessons through the prep department. And I uh, was fortunate enough to hook up with a horn teacher by the name of Waldemar Linder, who, uh, if you know your, your orchestral history, uh, Waldemar Linder was a principal horn of the Minneapolis Symphony Orchestra for about 20 some odd years, from the years of about the, the mid to late 1930s through the late 1950s, early 1960s. And so he performed with uh, the, the music directors of the Minneapolis Symphony Orchestra during his tenure was uh, Dimitri Metropolis, uh, Eugene Ormandy, Fritz Reiner, and Antal Dorati. Those are four pretty huge names. And uh, there's a lot of Minneapolis recordings um, available uh, from that era. And uh, he was just a wonderful, wonderful player. And he was my teacher for eight years. I started with him when I was in eighth grade, and I studied with him all through high school, and then he was my primary teacher for three years uh, when I became a student at USC. And uh, my senior year, I, I stayed with uh, Mr. Linder through my junior year because I wanted to play a full recital for him. 
as, as my teacher. And then my senior year, I switched and became a student of the great Vince DeRosas. Did you, did you participate in your middle school, high school band programs? You did? Yeah. Um, so you went to USC, and your last year, you began to study with Vince DeRosa. What was that like? Well, I think that... Um, the, the, the best way to kind of describe Vince DeRosa is, I mean, he's, God made Vince DeRosa to play the horn. And, and he was exactly the right size. When he would sit in the chair, the horn just fit right into him. He never had to kind of manipulate anything about his body to make the horn work. And he just was the most efficient um, expert on playing the instrument. Every time he played, it always sounded like it was completely effortless. And uh, he understood the concept of air and sound greater than anybody I've ever known before or since. And um, if you speak to a lot of professionals, uh, there would be probably a very large percentage of most professionals that are really aware of the history and legacy of the horn that would probably say that Vince DeRosa is, is arguably the greatest player to ever play the instrument. He was uh, the man in Hollywood for nearly five decades. And um, he's still alive, he's 93 years old. And I remember doing The Simpsons with him when he was 85, he was still playing. And um, there's no other horn player I can think of that had a, a career that spanned, I have to think about this for a second, it spanned eight decades. 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s. Eight different decades. You've got to know what you're doing in order to be able to play that long on the horn. There just isn't a lifespan like that. And what he was, what, what, what he imparted to all of us was just the idea of creating a complete sound and learning how to play with a sense of effortlessness and, and relaxation in what you do so that you were never tensing up any element of, of um, your body that you, that you didn't need to tense up. And he was the master of sound, and he knew the orchestral repertoire, and um, you know those of us that were fortunate enough to have been his students really learned everything that w whatever we didn't know, we learned the rest of it from him. really incredible that you had that opportunity. Um, so after you graduate from USC, is that when you first go on to, uh, to your first orchestral position? Yeah, I was, um, I graduated from the University of Southern California in the, in the um, spring of 1977. And uh, I had been accepted to Tanglewood that summer as a Berkshire Music uh, Festival Orchestra. So I went there, and I believe it was the first week I was there, I received a phone call from a gentleman named Maurice Abravanel, who was the music director of the Utah Symphony at the time. He was the founding music director and was there for 30 some odd years. Um, he was also the founder, founding music director of, of, the, of a place called the Music Academy of the West, which is a summertime festival in Santa Barbara, California. And I had been a student at the Music Academy of the West in the summer of 1976. And uh, I, was, uh, I was fortunate enough to get a chance to, to play some really fantastic repertoire with, with Maestro Abravanel at the Music Academy, including principal horn for him on Mahler's Sixth Symphony, which was the first Mahler symphony I ever played. It's an incredibly powerful work. And if you've never heard it, I highly suggest you sit down and take an hour and a half out of your life and listen to this piece because your, your life will be changed by listening to that piece. Um, so he called me at Tanglewood, um, at Tanglewood, and he, he basically said that uh, they finally had the budget in the Utah Symphony to add an assistant principal. Up until that time, there was only enough budget in the orchestra for basically four chairs, principal, second, third, and fourth. They never had the extra money to have a contract assistant player, so they would hire extras when needed. And he said, we have an opening for, you know, assistant principal, would you like the job? And uh, 
uh, fortunately, that was the 1970s when you could get away with something like that, as opposed to now where you would be, you know, you would be breaking some rule somewhere about actually offering somebody a job without an audition in the, uh, in the, you know, in the, in the uh, interest of fairness and so on. So he offered me this job, and and since I really had no nowhere to go and no idea what I was going to be doing after I was done at Tanglewood, I said sure. And so uh, I moved to Salt Lake City, and uh, we rehearsed for a week or so, and then we immediately did a month-long tour of Europe. And the very first professional concert I ever played was playing fifth horn in Mahler's First Symphony in this 2,500-year-old amphitheater in Athens, Greece, that sits at the foot of the Acropolis. And uh, that was my first professional concert. And lo and behold, we get done with the concert, and there's this old Greek guy who is handing out business cards and photographs because he had been up on top of the amphitheater shooting us at the beginning of the thing, and he had already developed the pictures, and they were photographs for us to basically purchase. Um, so I have an 8 by 10 black and white glossy of my very first professional concert in this, in this amphitheater. Uh, playing Mahler First Symphony. And you can tell it's the opening of the first movement because you can see the offstage trumpets way over there on the side. So that's how it got started. All right, and you spent one year with the Utah Symphony. Uh, and, and why did you res resign from your position there? I, I resigned from Utah after a year because I felt like I needed to get more lessons with Mr. DeRosa. And I felt like going back to school and getting a master's at that time in my life seemed to me to be more important than playing assistant horn in Salt Lake City. So that's why I resigned. I, I made great friends in Utah. I had a fantastic time there. Um, I was spoiled rotten because I got to play with a really good orchestra and I actually got a paycheck every week and I got to uh, pack up my car and um, go to rehearsal at 8.45 in the morning. I'd be done by 11.15, and I'd, and I'd get in my car, and I'd drive up, and I'd be on the slopes at Alta skiing for $4 for a half day in the afternoon. My life was solid then. It was just the best. Um, but I just felt like professionally, as much as I enjoyed my colleagues, the, the principal horn at that time, Don Peterson, was nothing but supportive of me. He was a great mentor and really taught me a lot. Um, the guy who was second horn at the time went on to become the personal manager of the Boston Symphony for 20 some odd years. Uh, the gentleman who was third horn at the time went on to become principal horn in the New Zealand Symphony. And um, anyway, I had a great time with all of those guys, but I needed more, I felt like I needed more time with Mr. DeRosa. And I never got it because um, that summer after I had left, uh, Salt Lake City to move back to Los Angeles. Uh, I was all set. I was going to be a TA at, at um, and I was going to get a full scholarship and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I got a phone call from a gentleman uh, by the name of Leonard Slatkin, who is now the music director in Detroit. Before that, he was music director of the National Symphony of Washington, D.C. Before that, he was a music director of the St. Louis Symphony. Before that, he was a music director in the New Orleans Symphony. And I got a phone call from Leonard Slacken, who basically said, um, our principal horn player just uh, resigned. This was in August. And he said, our season starts in less than a month. We need somebody to play principal horn down here. Now, um, I don't know how you play, but your teacher says you're very good. Would you like to come play principal horn in New Orleans until such time as we have, a, have, a, have an audition? When we have the audition in November, we will place you in the finals. Uh, until then, basically, we'll fly you down here, and we will put you up, and you'll get to play principal horn with our orchestra. And how could you say no to that? So here I am, 22 years old, and I'm offered a job as principal horn in a major symphony orchestra, and I'm getting a paycheck every week. How can you say no to that? Um, the, the fantastic experience about all of that was the, when, when Slacken said, I don't know who you are, but your teacher says you're very good. I don't know how you play, but your teacher says you're very good. Leonard Slacken is also from Los Angeles. His mother and father were concert, uh, uh, were, uh, 
his father was concertmaster of the orchestra at 20th Century Fox Studios. His mother was principal cello at the 20th Century Fox Studios. And Vince DeRosa was principal horn at 20th Century Fox Studios. So clearly, um, Leonard spoke to his mother, who was still alive at that time, and clearly his mother spoke to my teacher. And it was through that connection that um, I think that's how that happened. So at 22 years old, I became the principal horn of the New Orleans Orchestra. And I was there for two seasons. So I think I speak for most of us here that this is something we aspire to, is just to win a job with an orchestra. Uh, and here you've been offered two jobs, and you quit one in the first year, and you quit the other one after two years. Why did you leave New Orleans? Well, I decided to leave the New Orleans Symphony for a couple of reasons. Um, number one, uh, Mr. Slacken was leaving already. He, uh, he, he had one three-year time in New Orleans, and he was already offered the job in St. Louis, and so he took the job in St. Louis. But also, when I was in New Orleans, I, um, uh, I, I began to kind of explore, explore my interest in, in jazz. I figure if I'm in New Orleans, I'm, what, am I crazy? Why shouldn't I at least start learning a little bit more about jazz? Because I mentioned earlier my first instrument was piano, and I continued to play keyboards kind of throughout my life, and I played in a rock and roll band when I was in high school and college and so on. Um, but I got this interest. I'm figuring if I'm in New Orleans, maybe I should s play some jazz. And so I started asking around, um, who should I take, who, if you were going to recommend anybody to take jazz lessons from, who would it be? And I asked, I don't know, probably half a dozen people, and the same name came up each time. Um, they said, the, the only guy, the, the, the man you should be studying from is a guy named Ellis Marcellus. And uh, so I became a student of Ellis Marcellus. And uh, lo and behold, there was this young kid who would come in once in a while and play fourth trumpet with the orchestra whenever we needed four trumpets. And I became friends with him. And we used to hang out a little bit. And uh, turns out, his father was Ellis Marcellus. And the young kid's name was Winton Marcellus. And, uh, you know, I knew Winton as a high school kid who could play classical music and play some jazz, and he could play the heck out of the Brandenburg Second Concerto. And, you know, when, when I left New Orleans and went back to L.A., I started telling people, hey, there's this kid. Pay attention to this name because you're going to be hearing a lot about this name. You know, it didn't exactly take a genius to figure out that Wynton Marcellus was going to be who he was going to be. Um, but uh, I, I decided that I, I, be, I got a real passion for jazz, and I started playing quite a bit of it down there. And I began to realize that I, here I was, 24 years old, thinking, okay, my, my music director's leaving. This sounds like a pivotal moment in my life. Do I want to stay here? Or do I want to kind of explore the rest of what makes me a musician? Uh, as much as I love the repertoire, I was around a, a bunch of people that were in their mid to late 30s in the orchestra that were already there seven, eight years longer than they ever expected to be there. And I was already kind of starting to see the um, cynicism of you know, being an orchestra player in, in a symphony orchestra. And I looked around and I said, do, is, do I really want to think like this? Do I want to be like this? Do I want to be around this? And um, I had some very good friends there. But it came to my attention that if I was going to make a break from it, now would be the time to do it. And I thought, if I'm going to make a mistake by leaving something like this, I'm 24 years old. Hopefully, I'm not too old to rectify the mistake. And I wanted to see what else there was out there for me. And I thought, if I was away from the symphony orchestra world for a, m for a year and really missed it, then I'd seriously consider going back to it. And I was fortunate enough to kind of move back to Los Angeles and began to kind of pick up a few things and became a member of the Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra right away. And uh, I never missed the full-time symphony orchestra world enough to ever go back. And fortunately, I never had to make that choice. So that's why I did. The horn is not usually an instrument we associate with you know, being an, a jazz instrument, being in the jazz band. Uh, I've always thought it would be a great instrument because we've already got our hand in the bell. And there's so many different colors that we, we can achieve as horn players uh, and also uh, get by manipulating the hand in the bell. 
you know, we see you know, the trombones and the trumpets using all kinds of different mutes or putting your hand up there. Um, so did you start out playing the horn when you were studying with um, Mr. Marcellus? That's all I ever played. Yeah, um, I didn't have the technical proficiency to be any good at playing jazz piano, but because um, I'm kind of more of an Elton John kind of player, that's what I can do. But but I, I you know I, I would listen to Art Tatum, and Oscar Peterson and Teddy Wilson and just realize no wait a minute that's way out of my league, um, and, and so I. I, I, I started playing horn and uh, playing jazz on the horn. That was the only instrument I ever really tried to do it on. And the interesting thing was I never listened to jazz horn players. That's, that's the thing. It's like we as horn players, we think, well, jazz horn, jazz horn. It, 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 the horn is the voice, you know? The horn is the, the, horn, the, horn is the voice. It, it's, it's not about playing jazz horn. It's about playing jazz. And so I listened to every instrument I could think of. But, you know, the, the, the biggest influences, I can say, that, that I really had was, I mean, I, I listened to, to, to Ella Fitzgerald and Frank Sinatra and uh, Thelonious Monk and, and, and uh, Clifford Brown and Clark Terry and, and Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie and, and, you know, Jimmy Blanton and Charlie Christian and, and uh, you know, um, Philly Joe Jones and Elvin Jones and you name it. I listen to everybody. Count Basie and Duke Ellington and, and Woody Herman and, and uh, Maynard Ferguson and et cetera. Um, I didn't care what instrument they were playing. I wanted to listen to what they were doing. I mean, there are no fake books in F, you know? I mean, it's another reason I mentioned earlier about I always th speak in concert pitch. There are no fake books in F. We got to learn the tunes, you know. And and so uh, it was for me the, the 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 passion about it was instead of learning how to improvise, all I wanted to do was learn how to play the way that they played. And so I didn't start off by trying to improvise. I started off by trying to make a note sound like they made it sound. If, if, if I'm listening to the Count Basie Orchestra, how can I make that sound on that note the way that they're making it sound? And I just went for absolute replication first. And then from there, I was able to, to get inside of it. Improvising is not all that difficult if you understand what the nuts and bolts are. Don't try to look at filigree before you look at the foundation. If you can figure that out, then everything else comes from there. I learned that from Count Basie. He could make one note swing more than anybody else I ever heard. All right, so uh, you're heading into your mid-20s. You're in L.A., back in L.A., playing with your third symphony orchestra, professional group already. Uh, it's at this point you begin playing with this, the Hollywood studios, is that correct? Uh, what was that like when you got the first call? Well, it was interesting because... Um, the very first call, I'll never forget it. Um, it was uh, at Universal Studios. The contractor was a woman named Sandy DeCrescent, who at that time was the contractor at Universal. Um, and then she be then she went on to become the, the most successful contractor in, in Hollywood. Um, the composer was a guy named Billy Goldenberg. Uh, the, it was a television show that was called The Gangster Chronicles. I'm sure all of you remember it. Um, and uh, when I got the phone call, it was, uh, uh, we have a, a three or four hour session at Universal Studios on this date at this time uh, for this composer, um, and, you'll be, and you'll be principal. Now the bizarre part about that was the last four words, and you'll be principal. Because usually you go in, and if you're not uh, told your first horn, you're gonna go down and sit wherever the last chair is and you're gonna speak when spoken to, and you're going to not be noticed all day long. That's what the mark of a successful first time freelancer does. You don't draw attention to yourself. You just sit there and you blend in, and that's it. And that's the best job you could possibly do. Well, that I wasn't allowed that because they said you're gonna be playing first horn. And the reason why that was, was that Sandy was overheard on a session saying, I've got so many calls this next week, 
and I just got another one, and all of my first horn players are busy. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to fill this section. And a couple people overheard her and said, hey, there's this new kid. He just was principal horn in New Orleans. He's from here. He's not bad. Maybe you might want to try him out. And that's how it happened. My very first job was on first horn. And, um, you know, I just went in and did the job the way there was four horns on it. I'll never forget who was there. It was myself and Robin Graham and Todd Miller and George Hyde. Those were the four guys that were on my very first session. And um, uh, I remember the, you know, we did the best job I knew how to do. And I remember the contractor coming over to me after the set. Yeah, I could tell the look on her face before the session began. It's like, glad to have you here. <laughs> Don't screw it up. Don't make me look bad. Um, and after the session, she came over to me and basically said, we're going to be seeing a lot of you around here. And that's how it got started. So did you get called back soon after to do more? Um, yes. I mean, the, the, the thing about it is, is that there's a pecking order. And Mr. DeRosa was at the top of the pecking order. And the guys that he had in his section uh, were, were Henry Zigismani, who was also who also kind of moonlighted as co-principal horn of the Los Angeles Philharmonic back in the days of Zubin Mehta, music director. Um, uh, Richard Parisi, who was a great, great, great player. Art Mobby, who was a great, great, great player. Those were the guys. And then there was all these other guys. Um, that was Vince's section. And then there was Jim Decker and Gail Robinson and Alan Robinson and just all of these, you know, legendary names. Uh, Wendell Haas was still playing a session here and there. Um, uh, Sinclair Lott, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All of these great names were, were played. David Duke was another one. And um, so I was, you know, one of the low guys on the totem pole, but I started working more regularly, like I would get a session once a week, maybe once every other week, and it was kind of like, oh yeah, he's a new guy, oh well, we're, we're kind of, we got our regular guys, but oh, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll fit him in. Yeah, I already did a good job, we'll try him. And it just kind of snowballed from like one session a week, every other week or something like that, to like two or three sessions a week, and before I knew it, I was starting to work basically four or five sessions a week which was pretty darn good for, you know, a new kid on the block. And I was still not, I was still doing mostly like television and the kind of the stuff that the big boys didn't want to do because the real money was in record dates and in motion pictures because those were the things that paid royalties. TV didn't really pay any royalties. Well, now it kind of does because everything has moved to DVDs. So, but at that time, it's like if you did TV, they re-ran it again, you didn't, you know, you didn't get any extra money for it, but so the extra money was in movies and records. So that's where the, the guys wanted to do the work, because and jingles too. Um, so it was kind of a money thing, and I got I got to do TV because the other guys were too busy doing the bigger stuff. So that's how it got started. And now you've you've done over two thousand television shows, movies, jingles. Uh, I, I guess recently you just did. Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, a recent summer movie. Uh, can you tell us uh, some other movies that you've done, uh, maybe a few of your favorites? Well, at, at this point, there are just you know, so many of them, but uh, working backwards time-wise, um, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes I did, I did uh, Star Trek Into Darkness, I did Star Trek, uh, the, the one before that, um, all of those basically written by the same composer, a guy named Michael Giacchino. Uh, so anything that you see Michael Giacchino's name on, you're going to hear me because I'm his first one to have been. Uh, if you remember, maybe you don't remember, the, but the Star Trek picture starts off with a horn solo, and that pretty much is me. And I played it on a Hans Hoyer, 6801, although I didn't play it on this one. This horn, which I'm doing my recital on tonight, I never saw before Thursday. Um, and so I'm not familiar with it at all. And I'm gonna play the I'm gonna play the recital on it tonight. Or at least the first half of the recital on it tonight. Um, the second half I'm going to play on my Hoyer uh desk camp, which is my design. Uh, they let me design an instrument and it's the Hoyer RT ninety one. Um, the RT is me, which that was their idea to do that, which I'm grateful for. Um, 
None of that has anything to do with the movies I played on, but um, but uh, there is a brand new little um, there's a brand new little kind of uh, uh, video that Hoyer has just put out that I'm actually kind of on video talking about the 6800 series Hoyer, and you hear the sol the solo from uh, the Star Trek picture at the beginning of that, and I, I play it for the for the video, and I'm in the video I'm actually holding the horn that I actually played the solo on. So I just don't travel with it. Um, I just let Hoyer, whenever I go play places, I say, send me one of these. I'll play a recital on it. I'll tell everybody I've never seen it before, which is true. And, um, you know, give everybody an idea to know what these are, are, are about. But I've got, I mean, uh, memorable pictures. The, the, the first John Williams score I did was Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. That was incredibly memorable. Um, I did uh, uh, a fantastic score to a movie that was, it made a lot of money, but I never thought the movie was very good, but it was still campy enough to watch anyway. A picture called Independence Day. The, the score for that was remarkable. Uh, ten horns in Independence Day. And you can hear them all, boy. You can hear us all when we're doing that. Um, the, the, the end credits in Independence Day is worth getting the DVD for just to hear the end credits because that it's about eight, nine minutes of insane screaming on, on the instrument. We had a lot of fun with that. Um, all the Lethal Weapon films, did all those. Uh, the Back to the Future films. Um, I played on every Pixar film save for uh, uh, Brave, uh, Monsters University, WALL-E, and Finding Nemo. I played on all the rest of them, uh, which includes uh, Ratatouille, all the Toy Story films, uh, both cars, um, Up, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so many more. How do, I, how do I, how do you, how do you mention, you know, I, it's easier to, rem to, to remember like artists I've worked with over the years, you know, I, uh, Lalo Schifrin, John Williams, Jerry Goldsmith, Alex North, uh, I played for, uh, um, oh God, a Miklos Rosa's final film. Um, I, I, but Michael Giacchino, uh, uh, you know, you, you mentioned it, uh, Danny Elfman. I've, I've played with all of these guys. Alan Silvestri, it's just been a fantastic, fantastic ride. I've got to record with Elton John, with Paul McCartney, with uh, Willie Nelson, with uh, Ray Charles, with the Red Hot Chili Peppers, with Aerosmith with Barbara Streisand, with uh, Celine Dion, with uh, Michael Buble, with, um, uh, uh, what, what, what's it, Blink-182, uh, Kanye West, um, Michael Jackson, uh, Madonna. You, 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 know, you, you don't wake up one morning thinking, I want to play the French horn because I want to do all of this. None of us do. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to learn how to play the French horn because I want to make a lot of money someday. Uh, it doesn't happen that way. Um, I was just very blessed to be in the right place at the right time and happened to have, I, I guess, the right skills for whatever somebody wanted to have happen at that moment. I remember, because uh, as a member of the L.A. Chamber Orchestra, uh, we used to do a benefit every year and a, and a fundraiser one year uh, for our big benefit, we brought in Dudley Moore. I don't know if anybody can remember who Dudley Moore is. He's been dead for a while. He was a wonderful comedian um, who starred in the original version of a picture called Arthur. Um, and, and a really wonderful movie. And he was a fantastic, you know, actor, comedic actor. But he was also a very fine pianist. And he, p he did a couple of performances with the L.A. Chamber Orchestra, one of which was at one of our benefits. And, and, we played, and he played some jazz. And I got to play some jazz with him. Well, I got I got phone I got a phone call to go play for uh, a record session for a group called uh, Chicago, which I'm sure everybody's kind of heard of, and it was actually a record that uh, made them famous again. It was a record called Chicago 17. There were four or five huge hits on Chicago 17. Hard Habit to Break, and a bunch of other songs like that were were part of this record. And it was so great to be a part of that, and the producer of the record was a guy named David Foster. And, and, and David was sitting in the booth. It was just him and the engineer sitting in the booth. And, and we're in there playing. It was just a couple horns and the arranger. 
And David, you know, he punches and says, hey, wait a minute. Aren't you? Yeah, I am. But how do you know? He said, you played jazz with Dudley Moore the other night, didn't you? Well, yeah, I did. And he said, I was in the audience. That was fantastic. Here, I want you to make up something for this song. So on the spot, you know, yeah, but here's, a, here's, a, here's a little hole right here. Just make up something and play it there. And, and I did, and they actually used it. They doubled it with synthesizer, so you can't tell it's me, but, I, you know, and I didn't get any arranging credit for it, but that's kind of how weird things work in, you know, in the professional life. You just never know what you're going to have an opportunity to do. And the most important thing that you can do as a young, up, you know, young, uh, in uh, hopefully wanting to be professional at anything, you know, we're talking about music right now, but at the end of the day, we're not really talking music, we're talking life, is being prepared for anything that gets put in front of you. Because you have no idea what opportunities and what doors it can open by being prepared for anything. And that's what happened to me. All right. So after years of playing in L.A., you decided you wanted to begin teaching. Is that right? You're now at the uh, University of Miami, the Frost School of Music. Yeah. Well, I taught for years and years and years, starting at, at UCLA and then at USC for a lot of years. But but remember, in the in that time frame, I'm also um, I'm also so playing concertos with orchestras, and I and I was a member of a solo sponsorship organization called Pro Musicis that sent me in places all over the world to kind of play recitals. And in return for the recitals, I would give uh, free concerts in places where people couldn't get out to see music, like shelters and prisons, and and um, you know inner city schools, and and so on and so forth. So I I, I had all these incredible opportunities to do things. And um, it was during that time that I that I started teaching as well, and and I got to uh, I got, I started teaching at UCLA where I began with one student. And what's really cool about it is my my very first horn student at UCLA is now basically um, Yo Yo Ma's uh, personal business uh, touring assistant. And so every you know when, once in a while when I run into Yo Yo, I will see her. She will be with him. And so it's it's kind of like I'm it's, it just makes you proud to to kind of see where some of your former students have gone and and I taught for years at UCLA then I taught for years at USC and for I'm, uh, for quite a few of those years I was at both schools um, and uh, I've been really blessed to have a lot of really great students and I probably have more working horn students in Los Angeles certainly in the freelance scene than anywhere and I've uh, than any other, you know, teacher other than Mr. DeRosa, um, and I've I've got um, I've got uh, former uh, students that are playing in orchestras in three different continents, and um, and then I was offered a uh, position uh, for a while after teaching at USC. I, I did a little bit of sabbatical replacement teaching for Myron Bloom at Indiana University, where I was there for I think a year, year and a half, something like that. And then I was offered this teaching job at the University of Miami, Frost School of Music. And um, I went to go kind of take a look at it. They said, we want you to come down and see what we're doing. And I went down and I saw what was going on at Frost. And I, in, in all honesty, I've been to just about every school of music there is. And I've never seen anything like what's going on at the Frost School. They understand what the future of music is more than any other school I've ever seen. And I saw it after 48 hours. I said, I got to be a part of this. And so I did my, my, my interviews and played a little bit and went home. And next thing I knew, I got an email the next morning, and they offered me the job. And um, I kind of thought about it for a couple of days. And, and um, when we kind of hammered out everything, which took all of about 20 minutes, um, I took the job. And I have not looked back since. Uh, the Frost School of Music is an astonishing place to learn about the entire world of music. And uh, I couldn't be happier. And so. Right. You were talking a little bit about the future of music. I know um, for myself and for these students, 
many of them are probably not going to find themselves in uh, a music job unless they're teaching. Uh, orchestra positions are limited. Uh, not everybody can play in the Hollywood studios. So wh what's your advice for, for these students as they're preparing for their careers? Well, I think first and foremost, regardless of whatever it is, follow your passion. Because the world is full of people who don't give a you-know-what about the work that they do. And that's a really kind of unfortunate place to be. I've been really blessed in my life to have been able to make a living doing A, something that I love, and B, doing something where I feel like I haven't had to work a day in my life. That's pretty, that's pretty remarkable. Um, there have been days where I didn't want to go to work. There have been days where it was kind of drudgery, but, but I think that those days are so few and far between to the magic that, that, that is music. But the, I think the, one of the things that, that I have learned throughout all of the years of teaching that I've done, because I've been teaching now for three decades, and I have figured out through the, just the observation of the young men and women that I have worked with over the years and years and years is that um, particularly if you're an undergraduate at, a, at any school, no matter where it is, those years of your life are, are more about finding out who you are than what you're going to do. Because and, and statistics will bear me out on this. If you if you look at any grad if you look at any university graduating class that are getting their bachelor's degree and then check up on them within five or ten years after that, I would bet that the percentage of people who are actually making a living in the degree program that they got would probably be twenty five percent or less. So to think that, that your undergraduate years are about preparing yourself for a career, I would challenge that theory and, and suggest to you that perhaps it's more about preparing yourself for your life. And where this fits in, where music fits in to your life, is going to be different for each and every person sitting here. I honestly didn't think that I would be sitting in this chair telling you about all the things that I've done when I was your age. It just, it, it came across that, it happened that way. Like I said, I was, I was fortunate to be in the right place at the right time with, I guess, the proper skill set at that time. But um, I think that, that what I have always tried to impart in each and every one of my students is the, is the relationship of what this represents to the rest of your life. It should not be the be all and end all unless that is your decision for it to be. Otherwise, this is an incredibly learning tool for you about who you are as a person as much as anything else. I think that, that the, uh, to be a musician these days, you need to be kind of creative because um, the, the, the creativity, there is, there is worlds of possibilities out there for anybody. All you got to do is just go to YouTube and look and see what people are doing. And, and you just go, oh my goodness. There's this young kid, um, uh, oh gosh, I'm not going to get it right now. Jacob Collier is his name. Look him up. If you've never heard of Jacob Collier, go to YouTube, punch in Jacob Collier, and just listen to him. Um, go look and and watch him do uh, watch him do a, a Stevie Wonder cover called "Don't You Worry About a Thing." It will blow your mind. There are guys that are doing you know different instruments, horn players too, that are basically doing electronics or doing loops. They're beginning. They're playing tunes by other people where they're where they're they're building track after track after track, and you're watching this happen on YouTube. There is so much creative energy going on right now. There is this remarkable three-piece band called the Dirty Loops that basically just started doing stuff on YouTube. They, they basically do fusion jazz of covers of tunes, and they are mind-bogglingly good. Now they're starting to do records, and uh, I mean, 
the, 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 the possibilities are limitless. But most schools don't teach that. Most schools teach you how to go take auditions for symphony orchestras. Frost doesn't do that. Well, I'm going to backtrack. Yes, we do. But we do that as well as anything else. I mean, if you're my student in my studio and we're going to work on a lick like Beethoven 8th Symphony, I'm going to demand that you know what's going on in the orchestra. Because if you don't know, there's no way you're going to play that excerpt properly. And it's the same with anything else. Um, you got to know, you gotta, you've got to be complete in your work, whether it's music or whether it's whatever sort of other passion you have in life. You've got to be complete. You've got to dot your I's and cross your T's. And um, what we teach at Frost is how to create an audience for yourself. And, and you will learn how to, how to kind of do looping tracks for yourself. You'll learn Pro Tools. You'll learn Sibelius. You will learn how to market a concert. You will be forced to market a concert. You will, you will have to create, conceive, stage, write, arrange, produce, perform, advertise, you will learn every facet of it because not everybody's going to, even performance majors are going to have a career as performers. But if you have a passion for music, then there's lots of different avenues for you to be able to do. But in this day and age, you've got to be creative. I started noticing that about 25 years ago when, when I was a kid, that, that chamber music series around the United States, the major chamber music series around the United States were basically two things. They were string quartets or they were piano trios. And if you weren't playing any of those instruments, you w didn't have a ghost of a chance of playing anywhere. Now if you look at major chamber music series in most major cities, you're going to see ensembles that are basically 30 years ago, nobody would have ever thought of putting these instruments together. You know, it's not just the Canadian brass or this wing quintet or the, the chrono string quartet. You see all kinds of combinations put together. People are creating their own opportunities. So the, the rules as we have known them, there will always be a place for the St. Louis Symphony and for the Cleveland Orchestra and for the New York Philharmonic and the Los Angeles Philharmonic and the Berlin Philharmonic as long as there's an audience for them. When the audience dies up, those groups won't, they, they won't be around anymore. You know, it's called supply and demand. And unfortunately, we've begun to, you know, this started 30 years ago, 30, 40 years ago. We began to dig our own graves when we realized that, that music is in education in the public schools was a, was, a, was, a, um, was a losable commodity. So the idea of classical music being trivialized, Unfortunately, there's there's some realism in that, and you know you're you're seeing it in a lot of different places. The the most recent example is the, the lockout of the musicians of the Atlanta Symphony. You know, the 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 players of the orchestra want to play. They're not given an opportunity by their management because the management says we're broken, we can't pay you. So, being creative, being flexible, being an opportunist to kind of make the most of whatever sort of skill set that you've got is the really the most exciting thing about looking forward into the future. And the truth is, you can say that about anything. You don't have to just say that about music. So, uh, you know, assuming that, that most everybody that's in this room are not looking to be musicians as a profession shouldn't stop you from the understanding of the correlation of the, the, the effort that you put in with the instrument in your hands and the passion that you put into it during this time of your life where you actually have the time to practice it and you can't take anything from that to apply that in the actual career path that you want to do, I think you are, you are, you are selling yourself short and you're losing out on a few opportunities of things that you can find things to relate to over the course of your lifetime. I don't teach the horn as the thing that you're going to do. I teach the horn as something that if you want to do it, I'll help you get there. But believe me, there will be things that you should learn from these experiences in this room and the, and the work ethic that you put in that you can apply to anything in your life. 
the only thing I ask from every one of my students is at the end of every day that they look at themselves in the mirror and they be honest about the answer to the question, did you give it your best today? Thank you. That's good advice. Um, does anybody have any questions for Rick? Anyone? Um, Rick, I don't think I can let you leave as a Star Trek fan. I don't think I can let you leave until you play the solo. <laughs> Thank you so much. Does anybody have any questions before we leave? What's your practice schedule like? What practice schedule? <laughs> Look, um, I don't as much as I'd like to anymore. I have a family, you know. I, I have... Um, I have two children, one of which is sitting out in the hallway. Um, and I have lots of responsibilities. What was my practice schedule? I mean, um, when I really got serious about it, I, I, was I was putting in three plus hours a day. But I don't have that kind of time anymore. It's just impossible. Plus, anybody here who's, who teaches a lot, it wears you out. You get mentally exhausted. So, um, I, I tend to teach, I tend to practice um, when I can, and I will always begin with what I think is the weakest element of what I do. But I always start every day with when, it, you know, when the days that I really do practice, and I do still, because it's important to me, and I really need to get back into serious shape soon, because I'm, uh, between Christmas and New Year's, I'm going to be recording the Brahms Horn Trio. So I'm really looking forward to that. That's been a lifetime dream of mine. Um, and I, I will start off always with just kind of collecting my air and getting long tones together and making sure that my sound is intact. And then I will attack whatever the weakest element of, I think, of my playing is at the time and work on making that a strength. There you go. playing in the recital tonight and how did you go about deciding what to play? Um, I'm playing, um, I'm playing, um, I'm going to play a, a piece, uh, an unaccompanied solo work by Olivier Messiaen called um, uh, the Appel Interstellaire, which is in English known as the Interstellar Call, which is from a very large, it's an extraction of a solo horn movement from a very large orchestral piece of music called uh, De Canyon aux Etoiles, which in English is from the canyons to the stars. And so I'm gonna begin with that, and then I'm going to play the uh, Hinnemith F major uh, sonata for horn and piano. And um, then I will kind of play a unaccompanied um, version of Go Tell It on the Mountain. And then uh, we'll take a little break and then I will play um, some jazz pieces with a trio on the second half tonight. Uh, music by Duke Ellington, Thelonious Monk, um, John Klenner, and uh, um, 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 Charlie Parker. I mean, I don't mean that as a joke. 
Um, how do you approach teaching exit study auditions? Like how does it get done? A, a teaching, preparing a student for an audition. That's a that's a actually a really good question. And you know what? You're going to ask 20 different teachers, and they're going to have 20 different ideas. But here's what I basically believe. This is my version of what I think preparing for an audition should be about. Um, I, I like to break it down in what I call the four-quarter system, which is basically um, the first, when, when, when you, you start back from the audition date and you work back to when you find out about it and put it in, divide that time up into basically four different quarters. Now, this is when you begin doing the audition process because over time, you won't need to do the first quarter as much. But for me, the first quarter is about collecting your materials, your parts, your scores, whatever it is that you feel is gonna get you completely immersed in knowing the music that you need to know. And I'm not talking about looking at excerpt books, folks. If that's where you're going with, with auditions, don't waste your money, don't go take them. Don't learn this material from excerpt books. You're wasting your time. I can guarantee you the committees are not looking for the best player. They're looking for the best player for them. You understand? There's a big difference there. You can sound like a million bucks, but if that doesn't reflect itself in the fact that you play like you know the material, not the notes on the page, they're gonna, they'll, they'll, they'll get rid of you. I promise you that. They would rather take somebody that would chip a note or two but sound like they know exactly what they're doing. So the second quarter is basically practicing the material, <laughs> really practicing the material until, the, the, until you get to the point where you've got the material memorized. Because here's the way I, here's, here, I have a lot of sayings when I teach. And one of them is, if you think you know the material, you've got more work to do. That's the difference between renting it and owning it. And when you perform, you better own it. You know what I mean? So that's, that's, the, that's the second quarter. By the time you've gotten halfway to the audition, with any luck, you've got your material memorized. Because at that point, you stop practicing and you start performing. It's what we don't do enough of. We don't perform enough. Um, you were the one that played Mahler's, Mahler first, right? Do you remember, you didn't get it on the first try, you got it on the second try. So that when it was time for you to do it on the first try, you weren't prepared. You understand? That's not a knock ab about you. It's, it's purely a perception of how we go about our work. And the, the fact that in an audition, how many times do you have to get it right? Once. You have one time. When we spend the majority of our time preparing by practicing and making it better the second time, we're missing out on the first time. So by the time you're into the third quarter of this thing that you're preparing, all you're doing now is you're, 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 you're performing. You're performing. You're taking that list to say if it's 20, pe if it's 20 pieces long, you're going to take five pieces and you're going to perform them. And you're going to perform them in every permeating order there is. Go through every combination. Don't go back and play it a second time. Just start performing. Let your learning from the process be through your repetitive performances. And, and then if you need to still hack out a lick, then go ahead and hack it out. But the idea is performing. Put yourself in a mindset where nothing is gonna get in your way. See, if, if you've practiced the pieces enough to the point where you've got them memorized, You've practiced them enough. Now you can perform them again and again and again. The fourth quarter is about going through the whole list. Go through the whole list. Play, 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 play. Because when you walk into that room, that's what you're going to do. So you take out every possible you know, disadvantage that you have. Because your confidence level will come with the knowledge that you have of your preparation and the material that you've learned. Fear comes from a place of the unknown. I don't know of any other place that fear comes from. We fear what we don't know, right? We don't fear things that we know, right? So 
if we if if we walk in with a sense of fear into an audition, we're not staying inside the best part of ourselves. That's my preparation for an audition. So that you walk in there and you go, yeah, I know what this is supposed to sound like. If you guys agree with me, great. But I know what this is supposed to sound like. If you walk into an audition thinking that that committee, that they know what they want, <laughs> they think they know what they want. I've been on enough committees on that side of the screen to tell you that, that, the, that the events during the day will dictate what they want. You know what I mean? I mean, we can start at 9 in the morning. You can, you can be on the other side of the screen with a stand in front of you, nervous as heck, trying to wonder whether or not, you know, what they're thinking. Do they like what I do and so on? Meanwhile, they could be grumpy over there and not talking to anybody. And maybe they had a bad breakfast. They had a fight with their spouse or whatever. You have no control over any of that. What you have control over is what you are about to do. And your own confidence level and awareness of what you're about to do comes from the work that you put in. So all you got to do is go, yeah, I know how to play that Louis flat. I've done it 10,000 times at this point. Dog. There it is. Every time. That's, to me, to me, that's, that's how you prepare for an audition. Um, also, what is your opinion of uh, beta blockers and enderol and other equipment? <laughs> um... I don't have an opinion about them. I really don't. I'm sorry? Do you have much experience with it? Like you're I have taken Enderol on occasion. I, I, there, was a, there was a time in my life where uh, I really went through uh, where my confidence was shaken, you know? And, and I had uh, probably about a six month period where I really, there were times where I really didn't know. How did you go about deciding to use it and not to use it? Is it making sure that it's okay? I don't know. Um, <laughs> it was it was probably I felt I needed to take one, and that's why I did. I don't have them anymore. I don't take them. Um, I haven't had any. I've I've been able to work through whatever sort of issues that that I had. And you know, for anybody who gets their confidence shaken, it's funny. Somebody one time uh, they were talking about boxing. They says a boxer always feels like they're invincible until they get knocked down. And then it's it's not about getting knocked down anymore. It's about knowing what to do after you've been knocked down. And that's a really interesting way of, of thinking, you know, because when you're young, you feel invincible. And then all of a sudden something happens and you're not invincible anymore. It's like it's not about whether or not you get knocked down. It's what happens after you do, whether it's physical or, or mental or anything else. And all I did was... Um, in order to kind of get out of that help I've fallen and I can't get up and I'm swimming and I can't find the edge of the pool was to go back to fundamentals was to go back to okay what do you need oh yeah right I forgot I need air and air has got to go into the instrument and if I put air, in, air into the instrument I'm going to do what I want to do let's put it this way if I don't put air into the instrument nothing's going to succeed but at least if I do the mechanics I've got a much better shot at succeeding than I do if I didn't do that and I just began to kind of work my way out of it, and, and things got fine. It's like any time I feel like, oh, what am I doing right here? I'm going right to my air con. I'm going to put that in the horn because that's my best friend in the world. Sure. Anybody else? All of them. <laughs> D minor is the key of the pirates. Every single one of those movies, all the themes are in D minor. Arr. What's your favorite movie that you've played in? Favorite movie that I played in? The one that paid the most. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know what? I, that's, that's a great question, and I have no idea. I really don't. Um, I really don't. I'm sorry. Uh, it all depends on what mood you're in, right? You know. Some days I like the Who better than any other music I've ever heard in my life. Some days I like Mozart better than anything else I've ever heard in my life. Some days I think Charlie Parker's the greatest thing I ever heard. You know, if I'm in the mood for Queen or or Led Zeppelin or or Metallica, nothing else will do. You know, if I if 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 I if I gotta see. Um, 
you know, a lethal weapon film, I gotta see a lethal weapon film. If 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 I <laughs> if if I wanna see up, you know, if I wanna have a good cry at the beginning of a movie, I'll watch up. You know? That kind of thing. Do you get to see the movies as you're recording them? <coughs> no. Um, there are times where we, I mean, we will sometimes, there will be a big screen behind the orchestra for the conductor to conduct to, and uh, sometimes there will be the segments of film on that. And it was interesting because that was what we got to see while we were doing Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, and what was fascinating was the different levels of, of finish in the production that there were because there were some scenes where we saw the finished product, like what you all saw when you saw the movie. There were other scenes where they had not yet done the complete animation, uh, the computerized animation, but um, uh, but so you were seeing like uh, rough computer outlines of the apes and so on. And then there were other scenes where we did where they they had not even done that yet, so we were doing it to the actors that were wearing the body motion suits. Um, you know, so you would see Andy Serkis who played Caesar, who was also Gollum in the in the the, the, the Lord of the Rings films, um, wearing this this bodysuit with like five hundred dots on him that were all connected, and those were the those were the motion sensor things that the computers would then pick up and translate into the the final computerized product that you saw, and so uh, we see the film in different stages when we do get a chance to see it, but we never see it all the way through and it's never done, like we never start at the beginning and go all the way through to the end in sequence. It's just we have no idea, but if you look at enough of the film, you can get an idea of what's going on. You just don't get a chance to hear any dialogue or anything. So, And I remember when we were doing Jurassic Park, um, all of the dinosaurs were blacked out on the screen. So, So there would be there would be total scenes of like Jeff Goldblum and all those guys. Now all of a sudden, Jeff Goldblum would be over here, and the rest of it would all be blacked out. And we're all going, "Wait a minute! What? What? Come, you know, come on! How can we say?" And, and Spielberg basically just got on the talk over and just go spend your nine dollars to go see the movie. <laughs> Anyone else? I have two. Um, did you ever play in the Star Wars movies, and did you ever play in the Lord of the Rings movies that were made? No and no. Uh, the Star Wars movies were all recorded by the London Symphony Orchestra, all of them, in London. And from what and, and the Lord of the Rings, I believe those scores were recorded in New Zealand. If I'm not mistaken, I think they were. So, the, you know, there's a lot of recording that goes on in other parts of the world. So, you know. Are there a few films I wish I'd played on? Sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Anybody else? Anything else? Well, guys, I hope those of you who can come to the concert tonight will enjoy what you hear. And this has been a wonderful experience for me to kind of be here for the last two days. And I want to thank Eric for having me here. Uh, to begin with, so he's really the one that deserves all the applause, and um, uh, I'm having a wonderful time, and, and uh, I hope to see you tonight.